my name is Dory, and I'm a CTO at Incredibuild. Uh, today I'm going to speak about something that uh, I feel is very valuable. Uh, I found it very valuable in, uh, in our work, uh, and it's uh, about parallel computing visualization. So essentially, uh, we usually have a lot of data that is going on as part of uh, things that we execute, especially if we're speaking about uh, parallel computing. And this data potentially holds a lot of value. And I'm here to speak about this value. The reason that I'm saying potentially is because the story usually provides context for this data. And when we combine the data, the data that we have, with the context, we get value that we can uh, use. So essentially, uh, this value uh, is, is what we want to have in order to better understand what it is that we are running and to be able to offer something out of it. So when we have visualization to our data, uh, we, we see it every day, but it, 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 mean, it means that we can look at the data and understand intuitively what it means for us. Uh, we can understand it, we can analyze it, we can draw some conclusion out of it, and then we can improve the process or, or correct things. So, in today's uh, session, I'm going to talk about the benefits of visualizing our data, especially in terms of uh, multi-process, uh, concurrent execution, things like that. Uh, I'm going to speak about the challenge that we had and how we solved it in Credibuild and what are the hidden gems that you can get out of visualizing your data, uh, how to offer contextual information to it, how to combine your logging into this all visualization aspect, and, and so a little bit about your call to action on this manner. So <clears throat> when we have something to visualize our data with, uh, it allows us to actually uh, better analyze it. Uh, analyze the dependency, the relationships that we have, uh, analyze bottlenecks, analyze problems, anomalies, things like that. Even if I'm looking at this thing which seems, you know, something that I can't figure out anything out of it, I just took an image from somewhere, I can still see that I have more blue than red. I can see that at the beginning I have things which are longer than here. I can see that there are different patterns in this, whatever this represents. This is something I can intuitively draw out from looking at this image. If I would take this and show you the data instead of how it looks in a visual manner, you wouldn't be able to get anything out of that. And this probably, you know, this, this visualization probably translates a massive amount of data into something which looks more or less intuitive, at least to draw some conclusions out of. <clears throat> so, when we are speaking about parallel computing, and that's something that uh, all of us are going, most of us are going towards, especially in the world of C++, everywhere we have uh, multi-CPUs, and we want to take, uh, we want to we be able to gain value from this multi-CPU, from this architecture, so things are moving towards uh, parallel computing, whether it's parallel processing, parallel threads, etc. And when we are speaking about parallel computing, drawing information out of this data is even more important. Uh, because in parallel computing, we have a high concurrency level, and usually we have tons of data of things that are running in parallel. So if we used to have some kind of sequential information of things that are going on, with concurrent programming, concurrent execution, things are running in parallel, and it makes it much, different to, uh, much more difficult to understand. Also, it's much more difficult to reproduce. So if you have something, if you had a problem and you now want to understand what was there, uh, reproducing things that happen in a, in a parallel computing environment is, is very, very complex because things are timely driven uh, and communication between threads and processes and things like that. This is something that, you know, they, it has a lot of uh, uh, variables that can affect it. So, having the ability to draw conclusion out of something that already happened is more than important. Uh, 
in Credibuild, we had a similar challenge. And what I wanted, part of what I wanted to share with you is how we overcame this challenge and what's the conclusion we drew up uh, from our 15 years of developing the product. Uh, for for the, the audience who doesn't know what Incredibuild does, I'll just briefly say that Incredibuild is a distributed platform and it allows you to distribute, compute uh, uh, processes across cores in your network. So instead of having only uh, your local cores in your laptop, you can use all the cores you have in your network, the idle cores. So instead of running only eight compilation, for example, in parallel, you can run, run 200, 300 compilations in parallel across the network. So we are speaking about very high concurrency level, uh, things that are, we have a lot of variables, things can uh, highly change in the environment. Uh, we have thousands of tasks. Uh, if, for example, we are speaking about uh, uh, the keynote today was uh, about uh, Photoshop, so compiling Photoshop with Incredibuild uh, uh, surmounts to thousands and thousands of tasks that are being, run, uh, being compiled in parallel. Uh, and when you want to support and you know, draw conclusion uh, with more than 200,000 uh, users, uh, and most of them are C++ developers, so these are developers that can work also by themselves. They can understand by themselves, and they want to be able to understand by themselves from what's going on, how to analyze and improve uh, the, the, the usage of the tool that they are using. Uh, so what we wanted to have is the ability to both be able to give some kind of uh, visualization tool. So, for example, the the main use case, and I'm going to demonstrate it here, is uh, for a developer to run a very large code base, to compile a very large code base with Incredibuild on hundreds of cores, and then he would like to analyze it. How can we help him do that? And that's not only relevant for Incredibuild, because it's relevant for any uh, concurrent processing execution. Um, not only for concurrent execution, but uh, uh, even more in concurrent execution. Uh, and we also wanted to be able to allow uh, the developers to understand by themselves and to improve by themselves uh, with our visualization tool. So essentially what we wanted to have is the ability to take something like this, and this is uh, uh, something that it takes time to understand and takes time to dig in and see what's going on, to something that looks more like this. Uh, so I don't want to show too many slides and speak, you know, generally about stuff. I wanted to delve as fast as possible uh, into a demo and uh, also have a nice amount of time for questions if you'll have. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to do right now. So <clears throat> the way that I want to demo and, and maybe share our experience, my experience with you guys, uh, is by showing you the various things that you can draw out of what we offer. Uh, I want to emphasize first that uh, uh, what I'm going to show you, we also provide for free, and I'll, I'll give some more information on that later. But for now, I just want to show you things. So what, what we are looking at right now is, uh, is an Incredibuild monitor. That's, that's our visualization. So the, one, the people who are not working with Incredibuild will probably see it more like this. So this is the output of a compilation. That's for a specific project. But if we we'll go and look into an entire project, you will see something like that. That's very non-intuitive. And that's a compilation of uh, the QT framework, okay, the QT components SDK. So instead of running it that way, what we did here is we provided some kind of visualization for that. What you're seeing right now is you are seeing Incredibuild running concurrently the QT compilation, and that's what you're doing without Incredibuild as well. So when you're compiling your code, you are compiling on all your cores. You can see here on the left side each core that the compilation was executed on. Uh, and so that's something that you're doing yourself. And each bar here represents a compilation task being executed in parallel on one of these cores. So you can see all these compilation tasks running on all of these cores of this machine. 
So this is much more intuitive. As you can see, one of the things that we do here uh, is uh, uh, using uh, various elements in terms of visualization. Uh, so you can see all the tasks. Uh, I think that one of the more important things is to allow users, and that's, that's the things I want to share with you. And essentially, most of the stuff that we got here came out of requests from developers. And that's, I think that's one of the, uh, one of the fun things to do with Incredible because we're working with the top developers in the world. Uh, so we are also getting the feedback and, you know, developers, they want everything. So we try to do as many things as possible into this product. So I think that this is not only the, uh, what we learned from the 15 years uh, being in the market, but also the accumulated knowledge of what all, all the things and all the feature requests we got from developers uh, in the largest companies. Uh, especially C++. So the first thing they wanted to have is the ability to zoom because before that they weren't able to actually see and understand what it is they're seeing. So th once they can zoom in very quickly and of course uh, fast, uh, they can go inside and actually understand what it is that they are running. So every bar here represents a compilation task. One of the important things for you to use when you are doing some kind of visualization tool for your users is, is to use colors. Uh, colors allow you to uh, easily, more easily convey information to users in an intuitive manner. So here, for example, what, and, and the colors can, uh, you know, th this is something that can represent what you want to convey to your users. Uh, in Incredible, we wanted to convey something uh, very unique to Incredible. We want to convey uh, whether a task can be distributed or can only run locally. So green means that the task can essentially be, can, can be distributed to another machine, and blue means that it can only run locally. Uh, as we are uh, mostly aimed at compilation, we wanted to tell the user, listen, this is, uh, you have warnings, you have errors. So a yellow bar represents a warning and a red bar represents an error. So these are intuitive things that the user can quickly understand and you know, see the things that interest him. You can always also use icons, you can use hints, and, and I'll go into that as well. Another thing that the user wanted, they said, okay, so uh, now I have a warning, I wanna see this warning. So you can either use a hint, but usually the user will want to see this warning or message or whatever it is that you want to uh, show him as part of that textual context which is used to. So with Incredible, what we did is double-clicking a bar uh, could jump you straight away to the textual output and place you exactly in the context you want to see. So instead of just scrolling all the way through all the output, you can simply look very, very quickly and see the things that interest you, double click it and go straight away to the textual output and then come back to the uh, visualization. Uh, one second, I have a problem with my cursor. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So this is one thing. Another thing is, uh, as you can see here, you have the time scale. Uh, working with the time scale was something uh, was very difficult. It took us some time to understand what's the right way to do that, how to zoom in and zoom out uh, intuitively for the user. So I want to share with you some of the conclusions we had. For example, if you scroll in, if you if you zoom in, sorry, if you zoom in, and once you're already zoomed in and you are at the center, for example, somewhere like here, so you probably want to see something here, okay? Let's assume that I want to see something here, and I want to zoom this section. What we learned is you want to zoom for, two, uh, for both ways. So just take a look at this axis here, and once I zoom in, you see that we are go zooming in on both ways, so we are always centered, okay? We are always at the center of the screen, same thing when we zoom out. So once you have that, you can easily uh, uh, go and see the places where in that interest you. Another thing that uh, concerned us is how do we show uh, information in a very, very small scale. So here you're seeing a build, the QT, it took it uh, 15 minutes to run, 
but we have customers, for, for example, in Photoshop or FIFA or very, very large products that are compiled with IncrediBuild, it, it can take hours. So you want to understand how, what, what it is that I'm showing in hours. I, can, I have too many tasks. I cannot show everything because I have the minimum size would be a pixel. Uh, so what we did is we kind of find an algorithm that allows us to uh, uh, hide some of the tasks and show others. And essentially, I think that what interested us and will interest you as well is that the tasks that, are, uh, that failed or the tasks with warnings or things like that, these are the tasks that you always want to keep if you can. So if we'll take just a subset, an area, you can see that once I zoom in in this area, I can see more and more tasks that will come into life that weren't there before. So just seeing this is not always enough. Uh, another thing that we understood is that we want to have also uh, context. So uh, we want to see the context, not only of my execution, but of, of everything that happened during my execution on the machine. So when you, when you are working with a high concurrent execution, uh, it's very important to understand when you want to analyze and improve and find bottlenecks and things like that. It's very important to understand the context in which this execution is running. Uh, CPU, I.O., network latency, context switching, uh, uh, file, uh, file being transferred, file read, uh, uh, ideal cycles, things like that are very important uh, in the future, at least if you want to support a lot of users in your product and you want to support it offline. Uh, so we have tons of stuff uh, that we can choose from. Um, so one of the ma major things here with, with this kind of visualization is actually that the user sees that, okay? So he can draw his own conclusions before contacting us. Uh, he can draw optimization conclusions, he can draw bottleneck conclusions, etc. Uh, and one, one thing that we wanted to maintain is the ability to share this information with us in order to be able to help the user, whether it's support or professional services or other stuff as well, and also for the users to be able to share it between themselves. So this is just a file. What I'm showing you right now, and I'll show it to you in a minute, this is just a file I double-clicked. I can send this file to someone else, and if he has this software, he can open it. Okay, so this makes it very easy for users to share this file with us, and then we can understand what's going on on their environment. Another thing is that for example, in our context, which is most, uh, which uh, uh, a lot of it is build acceleration, uh, uh, a build manager can run a build and something will happen in this build, whether it's a task failing or something taking too long, etc. He can share this build with the developer just by transferring this file to him and then tell him, listen, in, in minute number uh, five, you can see, and let's show it, let's see it right now, you can see uh, in these graphs, that uh, I only have uh, three ready tasks, okay? Here is the blue line for ready task. I can choose from here whatever I want. I can choose tons of graphs to show. Uh, another thing that uh, the, the developers wanted is the ability, of course, to uh, decide how this will look like, uh, the graphs will look like. So essentially, I see that I'm running only uh, three tasks, and I'm only having ready task of three, so I can delve into this section, this area, and see that here, sorry, here, things are running uh, in a sequential manner. Okay, things are not running in parallel. How easy it would be to find that uh, in a textual logging? Uh, just imagine yourself what you need to do from this, from this context, to understand that you have a period of time which tasks are running in a sequential manner and not in a parallel manner. Uh, it's practically impossible. Uh, so here is the mocking steps of Qt, which are actually running in a sequential manner. So once you know that, the user can actually address that and see whether he was, he was able to address that. So uh, let's just take a look at another monitor 
uh, and that's using the incredible uh, predictive feature that allows us to better parallel tasks. So <clears throat> once I'll open this one, okay, and that was just, I didn't show it to you, but here it is. That's just the file I double clicked. So once, once the user has that and he fixes that, now you can see, can see that you know, things are always distributed, okay? So that, that seems maybe a little bit easy because you only have eight cores, so you only have eight parallel processes, uh, eight, proce eight processes running in parallel, but, sorry. Hmm. But if you'd had this, One hundred cores to run your uh, compilations with uh, it would be even more difficult okay um, so you can scroll down and you can see all the tasks on the left side you can see all the cores and here you can see all the tasks being uh, executed in parallel on these cores okay so it's very complex to understand what's going on without having some kind of visualization that's absolutely no way to understand that if you're only working with textual output another thing that you can see once you have uh, uh, things like that and you have the graphs as the context so for example the reason why a user would like uh, to use distribution is because he actually can see here in the previous example you actually, actually can see the ready tasks. As you can see here, I just chose two graphs to show. I can see that I have a lot of ready tasks. Ready tasks means for us that there is much uh, to improve and also for the user. So I have a lot of tasks in my queue. I currently can't execute because I don't have enough resources. So this is something that the user can look at, the developer, and say, okay, with, with this build, I have much to improve if I'll add some more resources. This can be true for IncrediBuild in a distributed environment, but it can be also true for any uh, parallel computing uh, software that relies on hardware, relies on memory, relies on uh, CPU power. Okay, so once the user knows that, he knows that he can uh, uh, add additional cores and actually get benefit because he has tasks to execute. Another thing is that uh, the user can see here that uh, his, actually his machine is mostly on 100% uh, CPU usage, which means that if he's currently compiling, uh, in this scenario, if he's currently compiling, he probably won't be able to do anything with his machine besides compiling. So. <clears throat> He will add more cores, as I showed in the uh, previous uh, monitor. He will add more cores. Here he added 100 cores. And not only that, uh, he also said to Incredible, listen, I don't want to use my local machine. Uh, everything that can be distributed, I want it to be distributed. So all the green tasks, no green tasks are being executed locally only things that we, we prefer not to distribute. And then you can also, the user can also see that, first of all, the amount of tasks uh, that are ready for him to run have dropped. And also the CPU dropped. So you, you no longer are at 100% CPU all the time. And in this scenario, we also reduced the build time from 15 minutes to 1.4 minutes. But so you, you, be, you were able to draw conclusions out of this visualization. And you can see that after you made some changes, you can easily verify and see that you get the proper results. In this scenario, for example, the user can still see that there are places where he still has 800 tasks. So essentially adding 800 cores can uh, also improve. But he can also, using this visualization, he can also try and estimate what the improvement will be. Because he can see that only, uh, there are only 10, 15 seconds in which these tasks are ready and then they are being spawned to his 100 cores. So even if he will add additional 100 cores, probably in this section, he'll only be able to save something like 10% from out of this uh, uh, 20 seconds. So he can understand whether this is something he want to pursue or not. You wouldn't be able to do that in a pure textual output. You simply, w there won't be a way for you to understand this information. Um, 
Okay. So this is another build. This is a Blender. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this a very popular tool, uh, but that's building Blender. Uh, so what I wanted to show you is some additional stuff that we uh, added here, j both for the users to be able to analyze and both for us uh, as, as, as uh, software uh, vendors that need to support their product. And that's something I believe that all of you need to have as well. Uh, so we've added hints to the visualization in order for the user to be able to understand what exactly is being executed. So usually it doesn't interest him. But when he sees a warning, he may be able to uh, understand what it is that he did here. So for us, what was interesting is to provide him with the, hint, with, with the build command. So he can right click here and copy his build command to the clipboard. Uh, but for you, it can be anything else. It can be uh, how, may, how much uh, the, the, this specific process, uh, what's the CPU consumption, uh, what is, what's the parameter that you, you, you sent it, anything that interests you. For us, it was the exit code, the build command, etc. <clears throat> um, and another thing that you wanted to have is the ability for the user uh, to search things from within uh, the visualization. So you have a lot of information here. How can we bring some of this information uh, to the user? So one of the things that we did is said, okay, let's, let's, let's see what's important for him. So the first thing was to, uh, uh, to, to make uh, things that failed or, or suspected as failure to jump up. So one of the things that the user can do is just uh, tell us, listen, John, you know, I want you to highlight all the failures. Another thing that you can do is simply to search for a bar, uh, to search something. I don't know, for example, copy. I saw that there is. And then you'll have some kind of highlight. Of course, you can highlight it uh, however you want. And something also jumped here uh, and not in the other machine, but we also gave the user in this scenario, and also for us when we are troubleshooting stuff, uh, all the things that are relevant for us on these bars that we looked for. So once uh, we search for something, we can give ourselves and the user additional information. Uh, so uh, you can search for everything, and it's up to you what it is that you want to search. So here we want to search for, uh, for, for text, but for example, if someone has uh, tracks down I.O. as part of his uh, executions, or I don't know, for example, when you are doing uh, financial derivatives, there are some kind of outputs. Uh, what's how this model did, okay? What's the revenue that this model did? So one of the things that you want to look for, for example, is just highlight all the algorithms that uh, gave me the best value, or value that is more than X or something like that. So it's really up to you. It's up to the problem you are trying to solve. Uh, another thing that we did here, um, let me see, um, is, is the ability, one of the things that user asked for is they said, okay, listen, we can see here all, all the bars, okay, all the, um, all the graphs. And as, as I showed you, you can choose, uh, I think we have several dozens of graphs that we thought that are relevant, mostly around uh, synchronization, CPU, uh, I.O. Uh, distribution, concurrency level, uh, context switching, heap size, things like that, very low level resource related things uh, that the user can see. Another thing that we found very valuable is to, uh, uh, to, to make these graphs relative to one another. So this, these are totally different scales. We are, as you can see in the system graphs, you don't have a y-axis because you cannot put different graphs on a single y-axis. So we dropped the y-axis entirely. So the user only see the graph relative to the information he, he has. Another thing that we found valuable, and these are things that took us a long time to do and I'm sharing with you, is that uh, we set the values uh, according to uh, the actual values he had during his execution. So, for example, uh, if I'll take, uh, 
um, let's say, uh, not all of them, but most of them. So for example, a utilized CPU, uh, we sell that uh, no more than 50 gigas we utilize, so we will not give you 100 gigs. So it's, we track down the minimum and maximum, and then we scale the graph to this maximum. We do some kind of rounding, but that's it. <coughs> so for example, needed helper will be up to 200 because no one requested more than 200 helpers. So we won't have a scale of 1,000. And then we make the graphs relative only to the graph itself without a y-axis. So this is how we can compare stuff. For example, you can compare the CPU usage and the utilized CPU and the, I don't know, the IO or, or things like that. And you can see if there are some correlations between graphs, even if they are speaking about entirely different things. If this is speaking about CPU usage and the other one speaks about, I don't know, task, number of tasks you're executing and the other speak about uh, uh, swapping, uh, you can see correlations, and by seeing this kind of correlation, it helps you uh, analyze and improve and find some anomalies or relations in, 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 you, in your executions. Uh, <coughs> so this is here. Uh, one of the other things that we understood is that once we already have that, and the users are working with that, it's very easy for them, it's very nice for them, very intuitive, uh, how, and we can get that f from them in order to analyze and to offer them some tips and tricks on how to improve or what's the problem. Why not add all our logging system into this? So this is what we did. So we, we took this, essentially, and we added other things on top of that. So and in, it's, it really, it's a matter of how you're running your build. So uh, one of the things that we've added is we've added a lot of logging. And we have added attachments, and I'll show you in a minute. But one of the things that you want to do, if you are doing something similar to what we decided to do, is to make sure uh, this is not the default behavior. Because doing all our logging into this system will take considerable uh, resource, amount of resource. It will uh, take some uh, performance out of uh, the execution. Uh, so we wanted to give it only as, as, uh, uh, as a special uh, flag. So only when the user sets the logging level to be extended, we will keep and save all this information, which makes sense. But once the user will do that, he can send this to us, and then we can draw a lot of other conclusions from it. Another thing that we did is, as you can see here, we have a dev menu option. The user don't have that. So this is both something that the user can use, and we've added our own functionality for our R&D on top of this tool. And this is something that we are the only ones who can use that, because behind all these ana analysis tools, we have some of our intellectual property. OK, so I'm going to show you some of it. So for example, here, let's assume that uh, I have a problem. I don't know exactly even what it is, because I didn't look for it. But uh, uh, I don't know. Let's, let's assume I want to better inspect what it is that's going on here. And I actually want to show you. Um, so I'll move this. Uh, you're, I'm just sure I can't move this window. It was opened on my laptop. But essentially, we are just opening up because we highly compressed everything that I'm going to show you right now. So this was highly compressed, and we open it only when I did now uh, just open event log. And now I can see a lot of additional information, which is only available for our R&D and our support, and not available for the user. Uh, we can potentially share it with the user, but as I said, it holds intellectual property, and we didn't think it's relevant enough for the user to, be, to, sh to see that. So here, we actually did everything that we wanted to have as part of the visualization, of, as part of the loggings of Incredible. And one of the, one of the main uh, things that helps here is that this correlates to the visualization. So we can find things here. As you can see, you have uh, time here on the left side. So we can correlate things that are happening here on things that are happening in the visualization. Okay, and it's very easy to do that. So of course, uh, we, we, we have a lot of information that we take out, whether uh, the information about the environment, the registry, the credential, things that are uh, not, not user's password, but how the, how the things operate. Uh, and of course, the tasks that are being executed, I can go 
over each task and see the dependencies that this task has. Uh, I can click on one of the dependencies and go and see how the dependency correlates to other dependencies, etc. This is something that uh, if you build correctly, if you know you are doing a very good work of object-oriented be behind all of this, all this visualization, you can achieve uh, seamlessly and very easily this kind of, you know, uh, jumping from one place to another. Essentially, everything that we see here, most of it is already shown in the visualization that I saw, sh uh, showed you. So when the, the task starts, when it ends, its exit code, uh, which, is the, which is the color it has. Uh, so we have all of this here, all the commands, everything that we want to inspect and go over, and we can just uh, play with it and better understand what's going on uh, in, with the user once he has uh, problems. Um, so these are all the tasks. Uh, another thing that we have here is actually all the uh, commands that are being executed that spawns the tasks that interest us. For as you, so you can see all the hierarchy this way. And that's very, very relevant for us. <coughs> Another thing is for us to be able to inspect a specific task. So if the user, for example, says, listen, I'm running this task, and I see that uh, when I run it remotely, uh, that's in our scenario. In our scenario, it can be different. It can be when I run it on this uh, hardware instead of that hardware, when I run it in concurrent with other tasks. It, it really depends on the scenario. From our perspective, it's usually when I run this task uh, remotely instead of locally, I get a warning. And when I run it locally, I don't get a warning. What's the problem? Okay, and then we want to delve into this because uh, the user resides somewhere. He can't send us this source code that's proprietary, that's intellectual property. So we want to understand and be able to solve this problem uh, from, you know, remotely. So we need to understand everything that's going on as part of this task. This is not something that you see in the log of the compilation, and it's very uh, difficult to take it from, from commercial tools. So we needed to do something like that. So we, we just tell the user, listen, if you run it uh, with data logging, just save the task specific log. So we can save the log of this specific task. And again, for us, uh, we have this visualization tool uh, that allows us to better understand what's going on. Uh, so here we can see everything that the task is doing. And if we are speaking about you know, real time, uh, because parallel computing is usually about very low level uh, real time stuff, and you need to know a lot of things, and we, we needed to do as well. So we, we just log tons of information. We log the process creation, the path, the variables that were passed. Uh, we actually log, if, if I'll go and, we actually log many, many Windows API calls that are being uh, uh, processed as part of this process. Which files are being opened, which uh, Windows API calls are being called, etc. This is only a, a wrap up, this is only this is not actual information. We don't see here any of the real data that the user has, but that's not, that doesn't interest us. What interests us is the way that the process performs, the compiler performs. Uh, so that's all the information that we are getting here, and it really helps us in solving complex issues because then you can compare this with others, with good results, etc. Uh, and of course, you need to have excellent developers in order to work with these kind of uh, issues, but uh, that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, so this is it. Uh, another thing that users requested is for them to be able to view things. So they said, okay, we see all these graphs on the local machine, but we want to understand what's going on on the remote machine on which we execute our task, or in the public cloud where we scale our tasks to. So another thing that we offered is the ability to show graphs on the agent level. So as you can see here, these are all the local cores we're using. And here you can see each of these are a remote machine on which we distribute compilation tests. So we can actually see uh, things on the remote machine, how much CPU consumption, the IO consumption, etc. IT, uh, it really, it's really beneficial for IT in order to find out and see which machines actually may slow the build. Okay, for example, if I see uh, something like that, I see very long bars, 
I can say, listen, this is a remote bar. Maybe the machine, uh, maybe I need to purchase an SSD for this machine. Maybe it's an I.O. issue. Maybe it's a CPU issue. Maybe it's a network latency issue. These are things that a user can inspect by himself. I think that this kind of visualization tool, the amount of support that it saves you is, is tremendous. Because especially if you have uh, uh, very uh, you know, expert users such as we have, we are, we are working with developers, so they can draw conclusions out of it. Uh, it's not a home user. Uh, which I probably wouldn't give this kind of complexity to a home user, uh, but it saves a tremendous amount of effort from our side because it allows our users to optimize and understand things as they are working with the tools we provide them. Um, any questions? Till now? Okay, we'll leave it to the end. Um, another thing that you can do is, and this is something we are doing right now. We already have that, but we are going to offer that to, to users, is to save all of this information to a database. This allows you then to allow the user to query the information uh, in an open manner. So we can just run queries, uh, SQL queries on the database and find anomalies. You can say, for example, select all the tasks that are running more than one minute. Select all the tasks that are running on remote machine and consume more than uh, consume up to 100% uh, uh, CPU. Uh, another thing that it allows us is to offer reports for the users. For example, trends. Uh, and show him how the build progress over time, how to compare executions. And another thing that we can do here is to allow him to do uh, a replay. Uh, and that's, that's an, something which I, I'm not always uh, relevant for a user, but when he wants to share it and show things to other colleagues, this is something they are using. So what you're seeing right now is the actual uh, way that the user sees the visualization when he builds his Blender solution. So he's seeing all these uh, processes all these compilation processes being uh, uh, executed on the various machines, uh, etc. So this is, this is a nice feature. And it also allows you, once you have that, it also allows you to keep history and allow users to see uh, builds that they executed in the past, to replay them, to compare between builds, uh, and it's, it's a meaningful value for that. Okay. Um, jump up. Okay. <coughs> uh, one last thing that I want to show you is, uh, as I said, we do, we, we have a lot of things uh, in the developer side, and this is not open to users. Uh, we, can, we can add any kind of information we want on top of that, and it's very helpful. For example, one of the things that we do is we can add uh, attachments. Uh, you can add things that are relevant, for example, uh, system files that you want to make sure that are not causing problems. Uh, you can add uh, dumps of various information. One of, the, one of the things that we learned is we don't want to keep everything in a single humongous uh, log. Sometimes splitting this logically can help the developer analyze problems. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is offered, this uh, visualization tool actually is offered by IncrediBuild uh, for free. Uh, and you can, uh, just, just for you to know, you can use it to visualize uh, any multi-process Execution. So essentially, you can wrap your own multi-process execution with IncrediBuild, uh, and you can then see this graphical representation of your own executions. Uh, so you can download it either from our website or from directly from Visual Studio 2017. IncrediBuild comes as part of Visual Studio 2017 now. Uh, and then you can simply run your command with IncrediBuild, and you will get all this uh, visualization automatically as long as your uh, concurrent execution is multi-process. We process. We currently not support uh, multi-threaded execution. Well, if you have multi-threaded execution, you should either 
build your own tool or just do some kind of hacking uh, into the uh, threads themselves when you when you run them. Uh, as part of this, I know, I know, I'm familiar with the tons of libraries that allows you to get and write your own visualization. Uh, my suggestion is to start, uh, but if you can use something for free just to understand what it is that interests you the most, uh, it's even better. Okay. Oops. So, uh, important takes that uh, I, I want to share with you and just to summarize it, just for you, once you'll go back and say, oh, listen, I want something uh, as this for my software as well. Uh, so, I, I would start with uh, uh, make sure you are, it, I don't think I have it here, but first, uh, yeah, I have it. First, make it shareable. So, first, uh, allow, uh, so everyone that will uh, have this kind of visualization will be able to share it with other people. So they will be able to share it with your R&D, uh, they will be able to share it among themselves. That's highly important. Use colors, okay? Uh, navigation between the visual and textual. Users, uh, if they are used to textual output, they will not get along without it. Uh, zooming, contextual information is highly relevant. Before we had the system graphs, it made it highly difficult just by looking at the execution themselves to understand what's going on. Adding all the context, the machine context, the resource context is highly valuable. Uh, highlight anomalies. I don't know which kind of anomalies are interesting for you, but you should make sure that it's visible. Uh, Nice to have. Uh, I think that these are the main things that I see as nice to have is the ability to offer search for the user, to save things for the data, to the database and to be the ability to allow the users, if you have expert users, to allow the users to query them or offer reports on top of that. History and trends. Uh, and it made it, I, I, can't, I can't emphasize how valuable it is for us to be able to have all our logging as part of the visualization. Uh, a tool that we have uh, for our R&D. I think these are the major ones. <clears throat> so the main benefit, I think that you've saw, uh, saw it already, all the intuitiveness and the ability to detect, you know, uh, bottlenecks if things are running sequentially or resource consumption or all of the other things. And we have tons of, uh, I, I could show you tons of issues that just by looking at the monitor and the various graphs that we have, we were able to solve them and understand what's the proper way to run, to work with our product. Uh, but I didn't have the time for that. I just chose a few of them. Uh, that's an entry access for additional logging, shareable layout for communication, and uh, it sells. So that's, that's the face with the user. Seeing something like that uh, for the user when you want to sell your software, that's kind of your uh, visiting card, you know, the, the way to be able to visualize the things that the user is doing. Uh, and that's your call for action. I think that uh, first uh, try and understand what, what interests you the most, what's the take from your software you want to show to your users. Uh, I think that's the main thing you want to think of. And once you do that, try and understand how you can do that in an easier manner just for start. I think one of the main things that I learned during uh, my work is uh, that failing fast is very important. So fail fast. Go to the user with something and ask for feedback. And that's very important. Don't try to uh, nail it on the first go. Especially with visualization, it wouldn't work. Uh, you will be nailed out to what you think is valuable, and your user will probably tell you differently. Uh, so just give something and ask for feedback, and then improve it. Uh, and start with something, even if it's something small, even, even if it's just showing just a bunch of boxes, things like that, it will, it will do something, and it will show you the value of it, and it will keep you on this track. Uh, that's it. I, I would look for something free that you can easily use. If you have some kind of data, uh, here with Incredible, we wanted something that is live for the user. So when you build from within Visual Studio, for example, you'll be able to see it as it's running, as it's compiling. But one of the easiest ways is maybe to do it at the end. And it's also good enough can be in some software. So just log everything, but then go over the log and show it, express it in a way that can help the user to understand what it is that he did. Uh, that's it uh, for this presentation. Uh, any questions? Yep, uh, one second there. One second.
So do you have any tips on how you can handle the enormous amounts of data that you generate? So for example, for, for Incredibuild, it's process dependent, but for example, if you're uh, trying to debug a thread pool or something, you have it dependencies between tasks in these thread pools, then it's uh, probably that you have a lot of data that can be generated, and you don't know what data will be relevant, but you don't want to slow the, 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 your operations down by all the logging, so do you have any uh, tips or tricks that you that can be used to yeah. handle th large amount of data. Yeah. So I think that uh, the first first one is to first offer the minimal amount of data. So first, uh, when when we try and offer everything, we kind of uh, losing. Uh, you know, we are losing the the actual meaning, the the, the value that we want to have. So I would emphasize first on the main data that is relevant, most relevant for everyone. And I would call that the minimal set of information that I want to show. And then I can offer the user the ability to turn on additional options. So for example, in Credibuild, we have minimum, a minimal execution, minimal logging. We have extended logging. We have detailed logging. We have bar logging. Uh, so we, we kind of say, OK, this is the minimal I want to have for the user. And if you want to have more, and if we want to learn more, then we turn on extended logging. And that's, as you said, that's more data. It slows down stuff, it's especially I.O. It can. Uh, but that's something that uh, you usually turn on only for specific scenarios. When you want to tackle a problem, for example, when you want to run a set of executions in order to uh, find a way to optimize, uh, that's how we addressed it. Um, yeah. I, one of the things that we did as well in order to reduce uh, both performance and, and uh, space is uh, compression. We always we compress everywhere we can in our software, uh, both in the logging, both in the details inside the logging, uh, in order for, for us to be able to make it shareable and make it compact enough for the user to want to work with it. So that's one of the benefits as well. Yeah? Great. Any other questions? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Um, do you have any tips on how to visualize dependencies between different tasks? Yeah, so I, I couldn't share it with you right now because uh, that's something we are going to release next year. Uh, actually, you have some open tools to do that. The only thing, I, I can send you the names later on, but actually you have libraries that already do that and tools that already do that, and the only thing you need to offer them is the dependency in a textual manner and then they can draw the dependencies for you. So, and that's, I think, one of the main things that I, I would emphasize is that d don't ever develop something before uh, making sure that it's not out there. Because if you have something that you want to have, probably it's already in GitHub or something similar to that, and you can start from somewhere, okay? And it, for your question, yeah, you already have these kind of tools. So you just need to Give them data, and they will show, give you the visualization. And that's very easy to implement, very easy. I have two questions. Do you support Linux? Yes. And uh, uh, how much do I need to modify my make files in order to make compatible with your tool? Uh, you need, in your make file, you don't need to change anything. The only thing you need to do in your build command, you want to say, minus J, which is responsible for the amount of jobs make executes, minus J, 300. That will tell make that you have 300 cores. Make will execute as much as 300 tasks in parallel. Incredible will take hold of this queue. And according to the number of actual cores you have in your Incredible infrastructure, it will execute these tasks. So no changes to your make script. And you actually don't need also to install anything on the remote machines besides Incredible. In the Linux version, I showed you the UI version of Windows. Uh, the Linux version, the UI of the Linux version is a bit uh, different, and actually we're going to consolidate both of them. And another thing that I can share with you is uh, today, uh, that's very fast and looks really good and really fast for a developer, but uh, if you're doing it today and that's uh, older, go to the web. Uh, from my experience with Linux and the things we are doing, it's a bit more complex, uh, it takes a little bit more performance. It's a bit slower, uh, but I think that that's where you want to go uh, if you're doing something from scratch right now, and that's where we are going as well. Yeah? Uh, 
you, you mentioned that uh, Incredible is uh, downloadable for free, but I think there's also... Uh, That's a freemium uh, version of the... Uh -huh. But there's also a version you, you can buy. Can yeah. you uh, uh, give uh, us uh, the, the difference of these uh, two versions? Yes. Uh, so Incredible, as a freemium version, as part of Visual Studio 2017, you can actually download it as part of your, you can actually install it as part of your Visual Studio installation. Simply choose Incredible from within the Visual Studio menu, uh, the setup menu. Uh, and once you do that, Incredible, uh, you, you have a freemium version of Incredible, which allows you to work locally on 16 cores. You get all the visualization benefits that I showed you, uh, you get all the other command lines, top on first errors, batch building, things like that. But you cannot distribute your tasks to a remote machine. You can do that, and you can install up to five, up to four additional agents, but uh, but up to 30 days. After 30 days, you you will only be able to work on your local desktop up to 16 cores. Uh, you'll get some additional performance boost because Incredible has an optimized way of uh, running things concurrently. Uh, which is better uh, utilizing your local cores. So even if you're running Incredible locally, as opposed to running without Incredible, even on a 16 core machine, you can assess something anywhere between 10 and 20% uh, speed up to your C++ code builds, but that's only for Visual Studio uh, compilations. Yeah? Is it for free with the same things for Linux as well? No. <laughs> no, uh, for Linux we don't give it for free. No. Okay. That's, that's a bundle with Visual Studio that we offer. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I hope I helped you a little bit.